Are you ready to invest in yourself today? Welcome to the Wealth Builders Podcast. Where investment leader Billy Epperhart teaches you how to build wealth through applied biblical wisdom. Scripture says in Deuteronomy 8.18, Remember the Lord, your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. At Wealth Builders, our goal is to teach you how to build wealth through applied biblical wisdom in your finances, your business, and your investments. Hello and welcome to this week's Wealth Builders podcast. I'm Karen Conrad and I want to thank you so much for joining us. Today, we are going to be talking about the business model canvas. Technically, it's like business model generation canvas. And it's something that's actually a one page business document that is something that you can map out and you can build a business plan based on this one page exercise. You know, at Karis Business School, this is one of the core things that we talk about to build the plans for the end of the year. And I have worked with this, oh, so many times. I I do a lot of the business coaching with wealth builders. And I actually did it when I worked at Andrew Womack Ministries as well, because we had a lot of Christian businesses that came to us and they just wanted help. And so Paul Milligan, Billy, and I put together a plan where we would help people with a business plan to kind of give them direction. And this was always where we spent the the greatest amount of time. And we started out the meetings because we needed to understand what this business or nonprofit was about. It's really a phenomenal tool. And I just want to mention this to you early on is that if you're interested in following along with what I'm going to be talking about or describing today, I'm going to be giving you an introduction just pause the podcast and go to wealthbuilders.org and type in business model canvas. And in that, you'll see several articles, including a blog that has the actual canvas that you can download. And then when I go through the different sections, you can kind of follow along with it and see what I'm talking about. So when we build this business model canvas, this one page tool, It's sort of what I would say is like a business plan in a box. You have to start somewhere. Now, if I was to walk into a bank for funding or maybe present to a group of investors to get funding for my business, I would not walk in and just hand them this business model canvas, okay? But I will tell you that I couldn't build the business plan without doing this first, So I want to put this in the context, sort of where this is in your planning, but also it's something that kind of forces you or disciplines you, whether you're thinking about a business, maybe you have an existing business, you're trying to scale or grow, maybe you want to do a nonprofit. It really forces you to think about all aspects of the business, including the value proposition statement, and it's very eye-opening. A matter of fact, at the Karis Business School, which I teach at, along with Billy Epperhart and Paul Milligan, who introduced me to this tool, this is one of the core foundational teachings that we build our curriculum on. That is how important this step is in either starting or building your business. So let's start out with a definition. What is a business model? A business model describes a rationale of how an organization creates delivers and captures value. And I think that's really key because when you think about why do we create a business? Why do we start a business? Why do we want to scale a business? It all goes down to creating value for our customer. And so this helps us to kind of figure out how we create value, what our specific value is compared to competition or why we exist. And then is how do we get that value to our customer or potential customer? The business model canvas is a tool. It provides a language for business and it is literally a one page business plan. So the business model canvas has nine parts to it and it's mapped out into sections. And I'm going to describe and list those parts, those sections. 
And then in the coming weeks, we're going to be going step by step through them, where if you follow along with us, you will literally be able to build that business plan. Isn't that exciting? All right. So first of all, the business model canvas is um, got two parts that are on the bottom of the canvas. And these are really key. And there is a section that you list out your revenue streams because you don't have a business unless you have revenue. And then there's a main section that has parts to it that lists out all the costs. And so the activities that are in the business model canvas either go on the side of being a revenue part of the business or a cost. And why is this important? Because revenue minus costs equals your profits. And of course, profits is the goal along with delivering value of any business. Otherwise, I think it was uh, maybe Billy that says this, you know, if you've got an idea and you've got a business, but it doesn't have profit, you don't have a business, you have a nonprofit or a ministry, okay? So here are four sections that are the revenue side of the business model canvas. First one is a value proposition. We'll be going over that statement and tell you how to write that and determine what your your differentiator is. Second one is customer segments. Third one is channels. And the fourth one is customer relationships. So those four parts are underneath the revenue section. The other part is costs and the costs include, which we identify as we go through this, key resources, key activities, and key partnerships. And I know it's a lot of information, but no worries. We're going to be going through each of these and explaining them in detail. So if you've got the business model canvas in front of you, you see that our revenue streams are over on the right-hand side and our cost structure is on the left-hand side. It just helps to keep things organized. Now, behind the business model canvas, there are parts that aren't specifically listed but they're kind of the foundation under this that every organization needs. And I'm going to read what those are to you. You've got your operations. You've got your marketing. You've got your finances or financial. How are you going to fund this? And then you've got legal. You've got IT. And you've got your organizational management. And so we've got the business model canvas with the nine parts we talked about, then understanding that on your revenue side, you've got your marketing to support and get the word out there. And on the cost structure side, you've got your operations. And then every business needs to pay attention to legal, IT, organizational management. And how do we fund this? We fund all this through the financial portion, which is a, an entire teaching actually all in itself. So let's go through each of these sections and I'm going to give you a brief description of them to get us started out. And as I said, we'll go in deeper as we start to build a business model canvas together over the following next two to three weeks. So on the side of revenue streams, Revenue streams in that box, I want you to write in there that this is what you get. So when I put forth work, let's just use my example of a home staging company. If I go and I stage a home, what do I get out of that? Besides it's fun, I enjoy it, right? But I get the revenue streams. So one of the things that we'll be talking about is with any activity you do, any business you have, any work that you do that you spend time on, one of the questions that you want to challenge yourself and your team with is how many revenue streams can I attach to this activity? So let's just go back to the example of me staging a home. So I would go in and I would load up the furniture, right? Have the guys help me to get the furniture in a house and I would get the house staged. And then for that, I would get paid and I would set up the way I'd get paid, my pricing structure, all that. However, when I went in, because I actually went through this process, I thought if I go in and I stage a home, it's a lot of work. I do make money, but what other revenue streams might I want to consider that could work into that activity? 
And so I got my team together. And one of the things we realized is that, hey, there's a lot of things that you could do here. First of all, if I kept track, which I did, of the before and afters, and I took time to describe what I did, or maybe you know, even uh, do a short video that kind of shares what I was thinking with my strategy, I could take those pictures, that video, that information, and I could write curriculum or a book. And that's what I did. It's called Seven Seconds. And I'm working on another one called Sweet Tea. So when I go in and stage the home, you see that I have the revenue stream of staging the home, but now I've also got a future revenue stream of a book. Another revenue stream that we uncovered is that I could do teaching and training for real estate agents or have a conference where people would come and learn how to stage themselves. So in that, we use the same activity and we started to build additional revenue streams so that when I went in to stage a home, I knew I had multiple revenue streams coming in from that activity. So, I mean, I'm sure there's so many other more exciting businesses than home staging. And in a way I use it because it's very humble as far as like, it's not like I'm out there, you know, developing some amazing medical device or whatever, but I'm thinking about how I'm spending my time, what I'm called to do. And then from that, I'm maximizing it through thinking through the additional revenue streams. So I hope that you're thinking about this with your business or something that you want to start. Like, what can we do to create multiple revenue streams with your time? And when we do business coaching with clients at Wealth Builders, this is one of the questions we always ask because we are trying to find ways to help entrepreneurs, leaders, and businesses not put more time in, but actually get more out of the time that they're already spending or the uh, amount of money they're spending to support their business with the cost structure. All right, next one, customer segments. Your customer segments are simply who you help. Now, one thing, and we'll talk about this more, is with customer segments, they're not always who you think they are. When we think about customer segments, or we might say target market, and maybe we're creating something for kids, let's say it's children's books or something. Oftentimes we go, and it is part of our customer segment, we go right to like, well, the kids, they're our target market, they're our customer segment. But when I work with people and we coach people that have businesses that actually are geared towards products or services for kids, we remind them, well, let's talk about this. Who's actually making the decision, right? It's not a five or six-year-old kid. It's the parent. Maybe it's a teacher. Uh, you know, maybe it's a grandparent. And so when you look at customer segments, you definitely need to have a product or service that the kids like, but the person purchasing it is a very important customer segment to consider. All right, customer relationships. This is how we interact with our customer segments. And again, just going on the example of kids, with kids, the way that we would relate our customer relationship with them might be if it's you know a book or something we want it entertaining, we want it engaging, we want it colorful. So the way that we interact with the child is to create content in that situation that is really like something that the kids like to connect to. However, with a grandparent or a parent or a teacher, how we interact with them could be completely different. For example, we might want to describe to them what their, their child or grandchild will learn from this. We want to make it easy for them based on uh, their demographic, you know, their age, how they would be able to purchase it. We need to think through those things. In any business, I can assure you, has got more than one customer segment because you've got more people that you're either serving or making the buying decision. The next one is distribution channels. You can write this in the box there is how they know you and how you deliver. It's one thing to think of a product or it's to think of a service or something that you're really passionate about. But it's a whole nother thing to sit and think about how am I going to get this product or service 
to my customer segment. So these are things that we help you to think about through this exercise of the business model canvas. The value proposition, and we have a certain way that Billy has that statement, is how you help people. And interestingly, you usually will have a different value proposition for each customer segment. Now, just hopping over to the cost size, we've got key partners. These are who helps us. You know, generally, we're not an island upon ourselves. <laughs> you know, even if we say, well, I am, I'm self employed, and maybe we've got someone that is laying flooring in our house, which is why I'm thinking about this. So maybe we say I'm an installer and I'm just a one man band. I just go and I install floors. Well, it seems that way on the outside, but when you think about it, your key partner is who actually produces the flooring or if it's something that you have to use adhesive, right? How are they going to hear about you? Those are key partners. Key activities is what you do. So those are things that we think about for me to be able to deliver a product or service. What are all the key activities that I need to think about and plan to do? So if we go back to the example that I just used about the flooring person, even though it's a sole proprietor and Justin is actually working on it right now for us. He has several things that he has to do before he starts and he lays the floor. He has to think about it. I need to go drive and pick up the materials. I need to make sure I have all the tools that allows me to go ahead and either, you know, snip the vinyl to install it, a hammer to click it in. I need the plastic that I lay that down. I need to connect with the homeowner to make sure that I have access. You know, there's several things and that's just a very simple business model. But when you think them through, you won't get caught by surprise and imagine how nice it is when you've done this on the front end so that when you're at that point that you're launching your business um, or you're training somebody to fulfill and help you with your business, you know all the key activities, you've documented them, you can prepare and you can plan for them and communicate them. And then key resources is who you are and what you have. Okay, key resources are very important. These are the things that I have to have to be able to deliver on the service that I'm providing. A really good example of that is with my home staging business. My key partner uh, in, in that business, you know, was American Furniture Warehouse, where if you live in Colorado, you're like, oh yeah, we shop there. They were able to provide me with furniture at a low cost. And I had several key people that I worked with there that when I would walk in, they would come over, they'd say, Hey, Karen, what do you need today? Or I'd call ahead and they would help me find the items that I needed. The key resources is the actual furniture, right? It might be the truck that I'm using to get the furniture over there, but I need the moving company to help me bring it in. And so the key resources being furniture, key resources being accessories, right? That are things that I have to have to be able to deliver on the services. Also key resources, you know, I needed to know a little bit about the real estate market. I needed to know what worked in staging. I had to study some things and find out what's going to cause people to actually want to buy this home. So again, these are the main parts of the business model canvas that we'll be covering in the next two or three podcasts. And so I'm going to leave you with one thing today, and it's on the value proposition. And this is going in deep on one of the sections, but it's extremely important. And I want you to think about this between now in the next, next podcast. So write this down. These are some questions that get answered as you write out your value proposition statement. Number one, what value do we deliver? Number two, what problems do we address or what problems do we solve? Number three, what product or service is the vehicle of our value. 
And number four, what am I offering the customer that is either different or better than the competition? So let me just take you through the home staging scenario and you can apply this to your business. So number one is what value do we deliver? You know, on the onset or like from the outside, we might initially say, well, we, we make your house look nice, right? But that's not really the value that I delivered in home staging. The value that I delivered is I'm going to help you to sell your home faster and at a greater price, right? That's really the value that someone is looking for with a home stager. Number two, what problems do we address? And so for me, I had to really think that through, but a lot of times the problem that I addressed is that if people don't want to spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 on their property in updates, but they still want to get the value from the home. The problems that I addressed is like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make you spend that amount of money. I'm actually going to work with you to deliver the value for only two or $3,000 compared to 20 or $30,000. Oftentimes I would get brought into a situation where somebody told them, a real estate agent told them, got to redo your kitchen, got to update your bathroom. And they're looking at it going, oh my gosh, I don't want to put that amount of money in. Or another situation that was pulled into a lot is, you know what, Karen, this house has been on the market for three months and uh, it's not moving. And that's a problem and we need it solved. And that's what I could come in and do. Number three, what product or service is the vehicle of our value. And again, if we just go with that same example, the value is to get their house sold at a higher price in a faster amount of time. So the vehicle that I do that with uh, or do that for them is home staging. Number four, what am I offering the customer that is either different or better than the competition? And that was a tough one. And this is where the business model canvas really helps us because if you were to look in Colorado Springs, the market I was in, there's plenty of home stagers and they're, they're good, right? So why would somebody need in that market another home stager? So I had to do my homework and find out how I could go in and I could have an edge compared to other home stagers. So here's just some things that I did. I was also a real estate agent. So why is that different or better than the competition? That means that the agent didn't have to, you might say like babysit me when I was there. I was bonded. I was insured. I was an agent myself. I had access to MLS so I could study the properties. I could look at comps, bring value in that way. I could get into uh, with a key fob, you know, that only approved real estate agents are able to do. So basically I was turnkey. Agents loved it and home flippers loved it because they could just call me, have me look at something on MLS, maybe go over and take a peek at at the property. You know what? They never had to meet me there. I could have it, just send them a picture. I'm done. And that brought a lot of value. One of the other things that I saw is an opportunity in the market is that a lot of home stagers would charge by the month. So They would say, all right, I'm going to come and stage your home. Maybe there's a fee for that. Then every month that my furniture is in your home, you're going to pay me this amount of money. And I got to thinking that's so backwards because that means that if I don't do a good job, I make more. I don't like that. That's not a win-win. So I did a pricing model that was a fixed price. And I just said, hey, I'm going to stage your home for this. You pay me half up front. And then when it goes under contract, I remove the furniture and it doesn't cost you more if it took four months. But you know what? Because they would turn so fast, it was great for me because I didn't have to have my furniture tied up for four months for me to make more money. I made the same amount of money. And then when it sold quickly at a high price, we both won, right? I love that about businesses. Finally here, I'm going to give you the value proposition model language that Billy has us do in the Karis Business School. And then also when we do the coaching, it's great. So it's this, we provide blank, which is a product or service 
we provide whatever the product or service to blank your target customer segment. Unlike your next best competitor, you fill that name in the blank. We offer in this blank measurable differentiation benefits experiences that you list at what cost or price. So it reads like this. We provide product or service, you enter the information in there, to list your target customer segment. Unlike your next best competitor, we offer, and this is where you list your measurable differentiation benefits experiences at what cost or price. And so where this is helpful is it makes you think through how you are going to stand out from the competition. It also kind of disciplines us to think about what we bring to the table as a differentiation of benefits or an experience, and then where we want to price ourselves in the market. Okay, there is so much more information that we're going to be covering, but I hope I've got you excited that you can build a business plan in one page or you can get the ideas together in an organized fashion for your business. And you can go to that next level quickly once you think through this. Also, if you've got this idea that you think is going to be this amazing business, I can assure you that if it's not and it's not going to work, it's going to get fleshed out right here in this one page business model canvas. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And by the way, we've got a great event coming up where we'll be talking about this and doing some workshops among like 20 other sessions. And it is the upcoming uh, Wealth Builders Business Conference, where we are going to be focusing on business development and nonprofits. It's awesome for entrepreneurs. It's awesome for people looking to scale up their business. This is going to be unlike any other Wealth Builders Business Conference we have done, and you don't want to miss it. So check it out. Go to wealthbuilders.org slash events, and we would love to see you. It is in August. Uh, I think it's the 19th through the 21st, but go to wealthbuilders.org slash events to learn more and get registered. We have a very limited space available in person, and it's going to be in Denver, Colorado. Well, thank you again for being part of this Wealth Builders podcast. If you want to learn more about Wealth Builders, go to our website, wealthbuilders.org. If you've not subscribed to our email list, please do so. We have such great content that comes out to you from our amazing team. And again, uh, Billy and Becky's heart with Wealth Builders is to help you and I make sense of making money for making a difference. God bless you and have an awesome rest of the day. We hope you learned something of lasting value today from this Wealth Builders podcast. If you'd like any tools, teachings, or resources mentioned in the podcast, you'll find them online at wealthbuilders.org. Wealth Builders exist to teach you how to build wealth through applied biblical wisdom in your finances, your business, and your investments. Wealth Builders is a nonprofit organization. We depend on your donations to keep this podcast running. Please consider donating to us on wealthbuilders.org.